What's up, guys? It's John Nelson, and you are listening to the Starting Block Podcast. Guys, this is a show for complete athletic development. Our mission here is to give you the tools that you need to win, whether you are the athlete, the parent, or the coach. Now, if you are new to the show, I want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us. As always, I am uh, here with my co-host, Chris Scarborough. What's up? Good afternoon. How are you today? Doing great. Beautiful Good. day here. Yeah, yeah, no, it's nice out here too, man. It's like 70 degrees. Um, so, yeah, Chris uh, Chris is our co-host, and then uh, my wife will actually be joining us in a minute, Mandy. Uh, she's our other co-host. So let me tell you a little bit how our show operates, if you are new, because we are a little different than the standard podcast. We actually have multiple episodes within the show. So the first type of episode that you're going to hear is going to be the Q&A. And the Q&A comes out every other week. This is where Chris and I will answer your questions regarding performance, rehab, nutrition, anything in the realm of athletics and health and fitness. And Chris, where can they submit those questions to Info at startingblockpodcast.com. Cool. So that is our Q&A. Um, so that's episode one. Episode two is going to be a guest interview. That is also an every other week episode. Now our guest interview is basically like the standard podcast that you're used to hearing. It's where we bring in our colleagues from across the country and across the globe, and they share their stories of success and what they do with their clients, athletes, patients. Um, and so those come out every other week. That's what today is. And we'll bring our guest on here in just a second. And then the final episode is going to be that Friday fire fact or maybe Saturday sermon, just depending on when I get to it. And uh, that episode is not every week. I just want to make sure I have something good to say. But usually those are uh, guided wisdom, actually, as I think um, Dr. McMakin coined that a while back. Guided wisdom, some people call it yelling, but uh, it doesn't have to do necessarily with exercise or rehab. It's more the motivational side, the business side of stuff. Um, that's the structure of our show. You know where to submit the questions now. And we have uh, a fee as well. And this fee is called pay your dues. Pay your dues means share the show. If you got something valuable out of this, share the show, please. Pay your dues. We, uh, we put a lot of time and effort into this. Um, and... You know, we love to do this and give you guys this information uh, for free and connect you with these um, people in our industry from across the country. And if you get value out of the show, all we ask is that you just please share it, whether that's a social post, whether you tell a friend, a family member, somebody, just bring us somebody to the show so we can help grow this mission. Because this is more than a show, guys. This is a mission, and that's to help you guys win. Because we need... Athletes, parents, coaches need to win. We need to win in our country. So there's a lot to it. And we just appreciate you sharing the show. So I think that's all the housekeeping. I got everything covered, right, Chris? I believe so. There? All right, cool. So, all right, moving on to uh, the good stuff now. So today, guest interview, we are pleased to welcome Kim Pittis. What's up, Kim? Hey, guys. Good. How are you? Great. We are good. So, guys, Kim is a trainer and manual therapist um, working with frequency specific microcurrents. So if you heard the episode a few months ago with Dr. Carol McMakin, um, Kim works with Dr. McMakin and we are super excited to have you on and talk some shop. Thanks, I'm happy to be here. I'm always happy to talk about everything, so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I actually didn't know we were talking about this before the show, but uh, you have your own podcast <clears throat> as well. Um, Tell, tell the listeners a little bit about your show and, and kind of how you got started in all this, and then we'll dig into some of the questions and things like that. Sure. Um, well, Dr. McMakin and I started our, um, our dual podcast, Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast, uh, during COVID when everything was shut down and we were both sidelined. We were normally used to being on planes, um, me treating athletes, her doing seminar work, um, and we were just thinking about how we could stay fresh and share stories. So we started doing like these weekly Zoom calls when one of her coworkers said, you know, this is fantastic. This should be a podcast. <laughs> so we started recording them again, you know, during COVID when everybody else was locked down and trying to learn remotely and do everything that way. And then, um, you know, her and I take a very um, synchronized yet very different approach to FSM. She worked with a lot of chronic pain patients and that's where I think she sunk her teeth into it and loved, you know, her tagline changing medicine, one practitioner, one patient at a time. 
I had always worked with athletes even before I even knew about FSM or microcurrent. So I wanted to take my passion with the demographic that I love to work with. And so my, my side hustle podcast is called Game Changers. And it's less microcurrent, but more talking to the trainers and therapists that I've been able to work with, with the athletes and how everybody just has a unique spin on what they bring to the athletic population. Cool. Now, Chris, you've actually gone through the coursework with Kim, haven't you? Yes. Yes, we have. Did the, uh, speaking of online, it was when it was still available online, did the sports course. And yeah, I, I'm always kind of fascinated with some of the, the, some of the early stories. So how you, when you first got involved, I mean, you had that aha moment when it came to microcurrent because let's face it. One thing about microcurrent, you don't feel it. The patient doesn't no. feel it. So right. it's, it's a lot of times almost an instantaneous result. That's like, Holy cow, how'd that happen? So give us some yeah. of your early experiences with that. Sure. Well, just as a manual therapist, like it's in doctrine that machines are garbage, right? We do all, we create all the change with our hands. And so I went through my early career as machines were bad, hands are good. And I put myself through college as a trainer. So again, going back to just manual therapy, movement, exercise, that was the way to create change. So I sort of, um, I was probably one of the biggest skeptics and disbelievers of FSM because it was subthreshold. Nobody felt it. Some of the athletes that I was working with, I thought, okay, like they're, this is like the Jack and the Beanstalk story. They've been sold this very expensive machine for quote unquote recovery. And now they don't need manual therapy and they don't need treatment and they don't need anything else. And this magic machine is going to help them. And then I was working with some athletes with a few practitioners that I greatly admire and they were hockey players. Um, I was practicing in Canada. It was the off season. And one of the therapists was like, Oh, you've, you've got to try microcurrent and manual therapy. I'm like, Oh, that's different using it together. And then I felt tissue release within seconds that I knew as a manual therapist, was not possible. I knew that what I felt as the tissue was changing was something that would have happened maybe after a three hour treatment. In all honesty, like I'm not exaggerating. So it was that moment where you take your hands off and you're like, what the heck was that? Like, how is that possible? And then we started to explore just the different ways it can be utilized. So with the sports course, as you know, Chris, like I've broken that broken up the frequencies because that's how my brain works. I have to categorize and I have to organize everything. So we do, I use, utilize the frequencies in a rehabilitational setting. I use different frequencies in a recovery setting and then different frequencies for a performance enhancement setting. So um, the frequencies that I use the most are probably not ones that you would see in a chronic pain um, clinic. So that just shows you what the variety of options are when it comes to FSM. So give us, not I, I certainly don't mention anybody by name, but as far as like some of the conditions like, like in traditional medicine, I mean, my background's physical therapy. I mean, we, we would see, yeah. uh, we would see, you know, somebody with, I, I've used the example of a sprained ankle, you know, in a, sure. in a grade two ankle sprain was a month and, you know, or more, maybe six weeks. Um, and yeah. by the way, John's uh, stepdaughter, Mandy's daughter, uh, we got a story about that one here very shortly, but it some of those things are are now we realize don't necessarily need to take six weeks that you know right so I mean give us some examples of some of the things you've seen just from an ex just experientially what you've seen sure um you know second to third degree m c l sprain that was supposed to be you know three four months player back in nine nine days, <laughs> not exaggerating. Wow. Wow. Um, and no, I, I, we, I believe you cause I've seen it happen. Yeah. I think listeners might have trouble believing that <laughs> for sure. And I wouldn't have believed it either. Do you know what I mean? I mean, and it wasn't like FSM was the only thing with, you know, in professional sports, these guys are getting, or women are getting their hands on a multitude of amazing modalities with amazing practitioners. So, um, and 
you know, with this, you know, three, four months back in nine days, I'm not saying like back, back in nine days, but playing, you know, in a full capacity after, you know, seven, eight weeks, as opposed to, you know, three, four months. So cutting healing time in half. The problem that happens though, when you start cutting healing time in half is you get more and more disbelievers because the people that are at the top of the totem pole that are there to clear patients or clear their athletes are like, no, it's not possible. Just because some textbook that was written 40 years ago says that this ligament is going to take 12 weeks to heal, people are really close-minded to the fact that there are so many other options that are there to speed healing in a safe environment. And I, I think that's the main thing. We never want to rush an athlete back before it is safe to do so. But if testing and um, pain and diagnostic like ultrasound or MRIs are showing that a tissue is healed, we have to be open to the fact that it's healed. Right. Absolutely. You're 100% correct. And I think that's where, you know, kind of shout out to our local partnership with the the doctors that we work with here, you know, because they have that open mind, you know, right. because this technology is available, but a lot of people don't understand that like this stuff has been around forever, like, the, or not forever, but a long time. It's not voodoo, you know, it's just, yeah. uh, it's, it's trying to make it a little bit more mainstream. And I think, at least I know that's where we learned about frequency specific microcurrent. Like we had always used microcurrent to a degree, but not like FSM. And so, um, okay. You know, our backstory of getting, uh, of knowing Garrett Salpeter and, you know, the newbie, I mean, Garrett and I and Chris go way back, way, way back. And uh, when he, you know, brought that to my attention, that's how we got involved with it. And, and so it's cool to see FSM start to reach, you know, the masses a little bit more. And quite frankly, I had no idea there were as many practitioners out there as there really are. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great to see it changing and evolving and growing and you know, there's so many different practitioners out there from veterinarians to PTs to acupuncturists to naturopaths. And it just showed, I mean, when you think about the thousands upon thousands of frequency combinations out there, it, of course, it, it makes sense that it would reach so many different demographics and populations because it is not just a, you know, a one-stop shop. The ability to adapt the frequencies to the specific target audience, I think, is why, why I fell in love with it. Oh, you can't just use 40 for everything? <laughs> you know, you could. I'm not sure you would get the results that we do. I understand that. Right. You know, I'll get it. Uh, um, that is the take-home frequency, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So I got. So going back into kind of the, the fast recovery and um, on your side of it being in the sporting and athletic realm. So Chris said, you know, there's a, we have a story. And um, I'm just curious. I'll share the story, and I'm curious what your – next step would be so yeah my stepdaughter's a softball player and uh in high school and she just had a bang bang play it was a contact contact thing um you know and grade two medial ankle sprain um we i got her medically cleared in what was it mandy 12 days i think um something like that um yeah mandy's here with us now we had a, a little bit of trouble getting set up <laughs> but yeah we, we got married cleared in 12 days um, by, by, you know, the ortho that we work with. And we use microcurrent. We used, uh, you know, the newbie as well. So when you, like you said, when you have a doctor, somebody on board who, who is accepting that, hey, this tissue is healed, right? What do you kind of see as that next step? Meaning, did you leave out the strength component? Is, you know, is the area still vulnerable? Or, you know, what type of things do you like to look for even after that quick healing and clearance? I, I've always adopted like this three phase approach even before FSM. So it, it can't hurt during exercise. It can't hurt immediately after exercise and it can't hurt the next morning after exercise or after s treatment or something. So I'm always looking at those markers to make sure that we're not rushing and blowing through the stop signs. But as far as recovery goes, the frequencies that I will prescribe to my athletes, I mean, you talked about 40 kind of in jest, but that is the big one is helping excessive inflammation. Sure. And we do need some inflammation. And, you know, there's a lot of very cool research coming out using heat instead of ice because we don't want to rob the body of inflammation. We need those macrophages to go there and use that cleanup crew naturally. So why... While we do want to make sure that we're not getting excessive inflammation, we need some of that inflammation to go and keep that repair um, 
and process happening. Well, that's a critical, critical statement because in this day and age, everything you hear is, oh, your body's inflamed, you're inflamed, you're inflamed. Like, but with the injury side of it, like, we got to have some. You, you do, right? That's Otherwise, hypertrophy would never happen. If you never had any sort of, like, um, micro-inflammation, you would never get growth either. So the two go hand in hand. Athletes are, are always in that wear and tear, rebuild, remodel phase. And that's that's their homeostatic environment. So you don't want to go in and interrupt that. But like I said, when we're pushing and blurring the lines of getting an athlete back, yes, the strength component is a big one. And that was the new sort of component that I added to the FSM sports course, as opposed to just the FSM course, is this what I called reboot. So we know that whole injury cycle, something is injured, our central nervous system is going to shut down signals so that we're not recruiting muscles that are torn and broken to work. But then a phase comes where we're getting secondary muscles to fire, right, to take over the job of the injured tissue. And before long, that's the new norm. So those secondary muscles are firing when the primary muscles shouldn't. So what we've found very beneficial with FSM in that recovery phase and that return to play phase or the performance enhancement phase, whatever you want to call it, is getting that, those primary movers back online faster. And that's to me has been, if I have to pick one thing that I could do, that would be it, is getting those primary mu muscles to fire faster. And when you're blurring the lines, when you're speeding that healing process up, it takes a little bit for you know someone's nervous system to accept the fact that, what do you mean it's healed already? Even in a chronic condition, you know, we're talking about shoulders. It, you know, I have a love-hate relationship with frozen shoulder syndrome, <laughs> but when you're taking somebody who was stuck you know, abducted to maybe 40 degrees and after 12 minutes, they're up at 180. There's no possible way their nervous system is going to buy into the fact that that was safe. Um, so we use frequencies to help, you know, kind of reestablish that optimal motor pattern. So, oh, absolutely. As far as like, without going into what the specific frequencies are. Let's just kind of go into some of the different things. Uh, you mentioned 40 a minute ago. I mean, that's, that's, that's one yeah. for inflammation. But, I mean, but it's also, we also use 40 not just for inflammation. It's also quiet the activity okay. of, right? So when we're using it in a nervous system um, sort of setting, we're not treating inflammation in the nervous system. We're just quieting the activity of that area. Okay, so, makes sense. That makes sense, yeah. So... But there's other it. things too. I mean, clearly there's things that you use for say scar tissue or sclerosis. There are things like yeah. you know, normalize yeah. or restore normal function. I mean, sure. what are some of the different yeah. things? I mean, like I said, without giving specific numbers, because I mean, not everybody that's listening to this podcast even has access to microcurrent, but give us some ideas of some sure. of the conditions that can be treated, you know, with this, you know, using a microcurrent modality. Sure. So like in the acute settings, obviously we, we want to help with inflammation um, to make sure that it's not excessive, but you know, frequencies that are helping for torn and broken is a big one, right? Um, and we use that in a recovery setting also, like I said, with hypertrophy, if you have an athlete that's off season and is starting to try to build muscle, they're in that hypertrophy phase, they're going to be sore the next day. That's just part of it. Um, but if we can go in there and help that soreness by using some of the recovery frequencies for torn and broken, for instance, um, that will help them not feel as sore the next day and be able to train at a higher level. So we're checking boxes in that way. Um, in chronic conditions, like you mentioned, scar tissue. So there's a, there's a ton of frequencies that we use for scar tissue and every scar, piece of scar tissue is a little bit different. So I've really had to rethink not just what muscle is under my hand or what tissue is under my hand as far as is it the gracilis or adductor brevis? Is, is there a vessel there? Is, what, what does the fascia look like on top of that? How much adipose is under there? And how adipose scars is a lot different than how muscle fibers scar and how um, periosteum or bone would scar. So it's it's really made me a better clinician because I've almost had to go back and like relearn anatomy all over again because it, it's it's never the muscle anymore. Right. So 
I mean, I don't even know if that really answered it. I mean, like I said, from chronic conditions to acute conditions, there's there's the whole rainbow in between of what your options could be. And also the touch on the scar. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead Chris. I would say touch on the scarring side of it a, a little more, if you don't mind, because I, I do find that one interesting, and I should have prepared for that type of question. But, you know, I've always wondered that, like when you have, um, especially when you're using something like SFN, that's as powerful as it is just because of you yeah. know, how it resonates with it. What, in your experience, and I don't even know if I'm going to ask this the right way, like when you are breaking up these cross links and everything, how how do you see the body, you know, relaying these patterns down does that make sense like no for sure and you know dr mcmakin is brilliant as far as how she can explain how the frequencies worked um as far as you know cell signaling is is a model that we're thinking of now so that the new muscle fibers are laying down in a more organized fashion i just know if you are on a let's just say an adhesion for instance and i'm going back to just total manual therapy palpation and you know, if you've got PT um, in the room too, you, you put your thumb or you put your fingers on something, you know it's adhered. So I, I feel like scarring is a big umbrella term for so many different, is it calcified? Are the, is, is the scarring from something that was, be, that was cut and that repaired? Is the scarring from something that was pulled apart and torn and repaired mm -hmm. suboptimally? So, you know, like there's, in Dr. McMakin's course, she talks about the frequency 13, for helping um, that resonates with the cross links of an adhesion. So now we're going like super microscopic and thinking if you have muscle fibers, for instance, that instead of being in this optimal, um, you know, horizontal pattern interlaced, when something tears, they pull apart and they don't rebuild, our body doesn't rebuild it in this beautiful pattern. It, just like throws everything in there. So then you get these like cattywampus sort of cross links and we would use manual therapy techniques like cross fiber friction that would help disrupt those fibers, right? And then you'd use passive stretching to help, you know, pull those fibers apart to try to keep those fibers in the most uh, beneficial structure. So if you're using frequencies to help disrupt the cross links, and then you can go ahead and use either traction, passive active resisted stretching, again, to help pull those fibers apart, realign them. That's the way I, I see those frequencies working, especially with 13. 13, for whatever reason, loves movement. Um, I don't know, I, I, and I don't know why. Um, I wish I, maybe in you know a few years, we'll, we'll get more information of what it is about that frequency that loves to be manipulated. In That's that good to know because I have a 10-year-old Achilles rupture injury, and the Achilles on my left is three times the size of the Achilles on the right. And, it's, and it just healed, right. so, like, you, like you were just saying, just all kind of weird, you know. Right. And you I mean, you're, you're grateful that it heals and it, and it, and it's not in this chronically, you know, it's not torn. It, it, it does heal, but then I'll, I'll give you a nugget to think about. Please. So 13 will get you probably only so far. And the reason why is frequencies work with the root cause. It, it, it brings us way back to, well, how did the Achilles get like this? And when we're in real time as a PT or a trainer or a therapist, we see things in real time because we have to be in the present with our clients, right? So your Achilles is thickened. So yeah, 13 will help, you know, bust apart those cross links. But the real change I would, if I'm a betting woman, would be 124, torn and broken, because that was the cause. And then did it bleed? And then was there an allergy reaction? And then, and then, and then, and then. So then we really go back and try to dial in what was happening, what was the mechanism. So right, even the then, the, going yeah. back 10 years ago, I mean, it yeah. could still be a torn and broken issue. Exactly, and that's something that's been relatively new too. I think like when I, tore, when I took the course so many years ago, I would have never thought to have used torn and broken in a chronic right. setting. Um, but now as we're, as we're failing, like as it's like, well, why didn't this work? This was, this was scarred and why didn't it work? Like, well, why did it scar? 
Oh, because it was torn and broken. And then what else was happening? Oh, it probably bled. And, you know, so I think as we're, we're evolving and we're asking more questions and we're using our big brains, we're able to figure out what frequencies are working and, and why they're not and why they're right. failing. I think your statement there of, uh, you know, asking more questions of why um, is important because I feel like at least in our experience, like I haven't gone through the course, you know, yet. I, we and my wife, Mandy, hasn't either. But like I said, you know, having the use with the newbie that we've had and we, you know things like that, we we have used it quite a bit. But I feel like and Chris has said this, too. One of the things that a lot of people talk about is just the difficulty of, you know, processing the information and peeling the layers back, you know, because yeah. it's either sometimes it feels like microcurrents either a hundred or zero. And I know yeah. that's a, that, that has happened multiple times, you know, for me, and I'm sure it's happened to you too. Um, that thought process is, it's what, one of the things that really makes it special. Yes. Um, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to rewrite the course and just make a sports course is because as I was working with athletes, and you know how it is when you first learn something and you see those successes, you're like, why is not everybody using this? Why is this not in every single locker room and every single pack you unit? Like, what is the matter? Like, what is the world missing? Why isn't this everywhere? And so I would talk to other trainers um, and therapists and PTs in sports. And I'm like, have you heard of this? Like, oh yeah, yeah it doesn't really work. I'm like, what? I mean, it totally worked. You, like, I can't not see what I saw, but to you know to the point of you have so many frequencies and so many options is it's overwhelming and if you're not asking the right questions and it's not that these trainers or therapists are not bright a lot of the times you only have a handful of trainers for a team of 45 guys you can't possibly spend that time talking about what happened 10 years ago you know, to dial in the frequencies. But I, I think for the most part, there is a chunk that you can start with and get some good results with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Which kind of goes into the, my next question, which gets off topic on the sports <laughs> side of it a little bit. It, it, it relates is you talk about, you know, a couple protocols that are good to start with and like the general concussion protocol is, you know, a, a great tool. And yeah. So one of the trends that I feel like I see, um, I always tell people I'm kind of like a Jekyll and Hyde guy. Like half the day I'm on the wellness side of stuff and the other half I'm you know, on the athlete side of stuff. But when it comes to athletes these days, and I think all of us, I see a massive increase in just sympathetic dominance. Like people are just stuck in fight or flight. And there's a number of reasons you know, behind it. Um, you know, clearly what's going on in the world is probably part of it. But then you've also got blue light and, you know, overtraining and malnourished and overstimulated, et cetera, et cetera. So all that said, getting to my question is you talked about getting the primary muscles firing in the nervous system to understand that. And that's like a priority number one for you. Well, when we have somebody who is just constantly stuck in the sympathetic state and we can't Real, I mean, we can alter that manually with some of the techniques we do, but how do you, do you see the same thing? Do you feel, hey, I see more and more athletes stuck in the sympathetic state, which is subsequently going to create inhibition down the chain. The brain is to say, nope, stay away. Don't want to deal with the injury. Slow the healing process down. How do you utilize microcurrent to help balance out that sympathetic, parasympathetic, you know, balance and tone? Sure. Um, yeah, that's, and that was sort of, like I said, I had broken up the sports course into three mm -hmm. components, recover or rehabilitation, right? You have to have a good foundation if you want to recover properly and you have to recover properly if you want to have good performance enhancement. So what you had talked about were these recovery protocols that we have and I didn't design them, you know, that's all Dr. McMakin's work, but there's a lot of um, focus on what we call the concussion protocol and it's not concussion as how we would think of somebody with a, a head or brain or neck injury. This is, you know, um, these older osteopaths that would talk about concussion in like the medulla when we have certain stresses, right? Our brain is working, but it's like working in safe mode, right? It's just not optimal. We're blowing through the stop, time, stop signs to get there. So when I had taken the course, I was looking at the concussion protocol 
and we also had a sleep protocol and I would try the sleep protocol and it didn't really work but time and time again when I would use a concussion protocol it would knock me out people thought I was having a stroke because it's like I had like paralysis on my face I would start to get dwarfed I would just start to like fall over and so we started using this with the athletes and if you can get an athlete to sleep everything is going to be better in their life and so that was the other sort of game changer that I saw so part of it was just the manual therapy component sure but time and time again these athletes were saying man I'd run that concussion protocol and I had the best sleep and then I had the best workout the next day and we're getting guys off of Ambien and we're getting guys off of all these other um, drugs that they were using and so going back to a professional athlete and I'll use hockey because I'm from Canada and that's where I got my I cut my teeth with athletes were on these hockey players they're playing three days a week minimum right so and the games are not at noon the games are at seven eight o'clock which means they're not getting in bed until one or two in the morning if they're lucky because what are they doing after they eat they're they're maybe stretching maybe not they're doing some sort of recovery maybe not but their brain is rehashing every last part of that game whether it's good or bad they had a great game they're replaying it because they want to replicate that for the next game they had a bad game they're going through that what went wrong and they're not sleeping so you know I am not a sleep expert I, I that this is not my forte but I will never give a custom care device to an athlete that doesn't have a concussion protocol on there and the prescription is use this at nighttime before sleep um, time and time again so and yes there's protocols written you know for adrenal fatigue and adrenal support and you know all the, all these other things but the concussion protocol that Dr. McMakin designed is just it's beautiful it's the holy grail I don't manipulate it or touch it it's just use this to get to get sleep and it's never not worked um, I had an athlete that was at the Sochi Olympics um, no sorry Pyeongchang Olympics and I had asked them to write a testimonial for me because it, he was hurt twice at the Olympic Games, but would call me, we'd FaceTime, get him set up, and then he'd, he'd keep playing. And so I thought, this is going to be a great testimonial because this athlete has a medal, and I'm going to... And, and the testimonial was all about how he slept, how he never had jet lag, how he never got sick when the whole team was sick at the Olympic Village. And I was, I was, first I was so angry. I'm like, no, talk about like your broken this and your strained that. But I was like, no, that's awesome that he saw the benefit of being able to sleep, being able to recover and being able to like just stay healthy. So that was, that was a cool, cool moment well, for my Well, just career. kind of along that same line, nice. just to kind of, you know, so we're, we're kind of going into something that, that an athlete may not specifically think of as an injury treatment. Let's go into another area that's kind of along totally. the same line, and that is the emotional, like angry, or, you oh, know, yeah. I, 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 I got injured, and it was so stupid. Bob, okay, that's the way I, because that's the way I feel about mine, okay, my Achilles injury. It was so stupid what yeah. I did. And so, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's another, the emotional side is a huge point because now you got athletes, a generation come up that can't process it. Like they don't That's understand. Right. They live in a little bubble as a kid. You know, everything is masked up and, you know, I saw this, I saw that. You can't go play on the playground. You can't, you know, you're, you should break a bone when you're a young kid. Like tell your immune system learns you got to eat dirt. Like it's okay. <laughs> you need to do that. So I, you see yeah. these kids, high school, college even, who has their first injury and the emotional exactly. side of it is probably worse than the physical. Yeah, and you know, to be honest, like I said, I was a huge skeptic of FSM. I'm I'm a, I'm a science guy. I like data. I like I I do like the triple blinded peer reviewed studies that go back ten years. I I, I I I like that, and we don't have that with FSM. And so when I learned about the emotional frequencies, I was that kid in the back of the classroom that rolled my eyes and you know ended up doing something else while she was teaching it because I thought it was woo woo and I thought it was weird until it worked until nothing else worked and I was with an athlete and I was just doing hip flexion because like that was, it was like trying to get that last, you know, 10 degrees of hip flexion, nothing was giving. And he was, I'm so frustrated with this injury. I'm like, I know me too. I'm, I'm like, I'm losing my spot in the lineup. I'm like, I get it. 
he's like, I'm super angry. I'm like, shh, you know, and I'm trying, and then I'm like, oh, Kim, you're supposed to listen to him right now. You're not supposed to tune him out. Listen to what he's saying. And then it was like that moment of, you have a frequency for this. I'm like, no, it can't be true. And I tried it and it was kind of blinded because he doesn't know what I'm punching on the machine. And I'm, and I'm doing my, you know, passive range of motion for hip flexion. And I ran frequency for anger or fear, or I can't remember what it was. And the hip just gave. And he's like, oh, that feels so good. I'm like, shut up. It feels good. Stop it that it worked right now. Um, and so, yeah, it's a huge component. So just kind of like going back in the history of, you know, maybe it's not torn and broken, or maybe it's not scarring in that Achilles. Maybe we have to go back to torn and broken. Maybe you have to go back and like fear, anger, resentment. Like those are all emotional qualities that everybody has with an injury. Are you kidding? Like you're, it doesn't, you're never going to injure yourself right. and be okay with it. And that's a huge part of the recovery process. Like we talk all totally. the time that the nervous system's only going to allow you to jump as high as it knows it can safely protect <clears> you <throat> from in the landing. Like that's how yes. the body, it's protective in nature. So when we have these emotional triggers, these fear responses, so many people just are hesitant to address that or they don't address it at all. You know, it's like totally. you can't tell me that you tear your ACL. And even though, you know, you're healed, whether you use microcurrent or not, and you get clear that that fear of that is not still there. And that absolutely influences muscular recruitment because our muscles really and truly on the hierarchy of knees, they're not all that important. We need them, but we don't. And so that's the beauty of like, for us, muscle testing, because it'll show us that yes. the body's diverting energy somewhere else. And I think it goes back to the emotional side of it as well, which I think microcurrent just, you guys are way ahead of the curve on that. It's funny that you bring up ACL. I have a teenage daughter that tore her ACL last year and it's been, <clears> it's been <throat> a year. Um, it's as you know, it's a long process. Um, but we were running, you know, she was my quintessential guinea pig as are all my family members. And, um, yep. <laughs> you know, and so that's how I know it's safe because I use it on myself and my kids all the time. But from the get go, I was running some of the frequencies that we use for fear because the last thing I wanted was her to be fearful. She's a hockey player when she returned onto the ice. And it's funny, I had a meeting with this other PT yesterday who was talking about he has a client and that, that kid won't take the brace off after a year and a half. And as you know, there's so many compensatory things that happen when we're wearing braces and um, support mechanisms that are not necessary. And they are, they're seeing this whole trajectory of other things that are going on because the brace is, is still in place. My daughter had the opposite. Um, she never wanted it. She was, she wanted to blow through traffic. She wanted, it was almost like too much, too much confidence. Um, but I, I'm grateful for that because if, you know, we want more things to fire versus less, we want confidence versus, um, afraid to come back. So, you know, I learned right away, address the emotional components in mm -hmm. pack you. <laughs> that was, that was where we started before she was awake. So getting, getting back to just the variety of things that you see and assist with, what, what would you say is one of the most difficult <clears throat> things to help recover or rehab from in your experience, even with, you know, the almighty microcurrent? Yeah, like there, there, are, there are people that just don't get better. And I, I think a lot of that is, is maybe, you know, fear-based of, I, I don't want to get better. Dr. McMakin talks about it all the time of if you've had a chronic injury for so long, who are you when that injury becomes your better? identity? Yeah, totally. Yeah. You know, and so I, I had a few, few patients and clients back in Canada and I was working at a really big practice who, you know, I, I went home and I felt like the biggest failure day after day because I threw everything I could at this patient and nothing, nothing got better. So like these were fibromyalgia patients and, um, it wasn't until like I re-listened to Dr. McMakin talking about that sample um, size that she had of people that didn't return to treatment or just didn't get better. And well, maybe they didn't want to, you know, and when I go back to looking at that kind of demographic of, they, 
they were going to appointment after appointment after appointment and that was their life was treating this this illness and you know there's a lot that um we don't we don't know how many conditions that patient has but in the athletic population um i don't know that there is really anything that i haven't been able to put a substantial dent into um mm -hmm. chronic pain is a whole other beast so like that, I love the athletic population because it's pretty easy <laughs> and you're dealing with, and you're dealing with compliant people, you know, like they want to get better. They want to work with you. You know, I, I usually have the opposite problem when I'm asking somebody to do an exercise or a mobility. Like I'll have to say, if I want them to do it three times a day, I'll say maybe just do it once because they'll probably do it 10 times, you know, to, to try to expedite it. But if I'm going to think of a stubborn um, physical condition, I'll, I'll go to the shoulder for sure. Like I, I just went on this riff, um, with Dr. McMakin, our podcast, cause she was teaching in Cleveland. She was late. So I went off on, I have these frozen shoulder talk slides ready to go. Frozen shoulder is probably the most stubborn, um, condition that I've ever treated. Um, and I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I'm, I'm a bit stubborn myself, so we're a good match. So I've, I've really sunk my teeth into treating frozen shoulder and trying to, again, think about the different causes of frozen shoulder. I had no idea there were two causes of frozen shoulder, one from trauma and one from what we call the disease mechanism. So um, heart problems, diabetes, um, adrenal issues. So again, using microcurrent, if we're not treating the cause, we're never going to get the results so even sometimes treating the vagus nerve can be helpful with frozen shoulder mm. super interesting stuff yeah so. how do you, how do you how do you treat the vagus nerve so many different ways we you know we, we do have there's frequencies for that but even just getting them to do like vagal tone breathing during an exercise can be helpful releasing a subscap um so i i work with a few psychotherapists that have helped me with different vagal tone, whether it's a four, four, four or six, seven, eight different types of holds with breath work. I um, mean, every patient's a bit different, but I use a lot of breath work with releasing subscap right now with frozen shoulder. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to add that, add that in. Um, yeah. <laughs> I like that. What, uh, what are, uh, what are kind of some, some things that people could, you know, look, look, to if they're interested in learning a little bit more about microcurrent, um, you know, or some, yeah. or somebody like, let's use myself. Like I've experienced it with the newbie. I've read the books already. Like, you know, sure. where, where's that next step for people? <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, maybe going back to the frequency specific podcast that Dr. McMake and I have a lot of really good free information. We story tell, talk about different patients. Um, so that's a great, and that, that podcast was sort of designed for the practitioner and the patient, you know, to, to just listen to, to see if there's anything that no pun intended resonates with them <clears throat> as far as conditions. The Resonance Effect, Dr. McMakin's book is really good. Again, written for a practitioner and a patient to just kind of get an introduction to, to microcurrent, um, frequencyspecific.com, Dr. McMakin's website, FSM Sports 365. Dot com, my website. Um, so we're trying to get a lot of information, you know, out there to the masses. And then of course there's courses, you know, all year round for different practitioners. So you, you actually said courses and I, I actually <laughs> thought you said horses, which was, actually, actually <laughs> really horses. That I realized that I forgot. I wanted to talk to you about was, you know, the use of microcurrent with, uh, with animals. Um, can yeah, you it's... dig into that just a little bit? Sure, it's super fascinating. It, I, I didn't know that microcurrent devices have been um, used with, especially racehorses, for quite some time now. Um, when I'd moved to California, I started um, horseback riding a bit more. I had a little bit more free time on my hands. And one of the women that I met was like, oh, yeah, we've been using microcurrent on our racehorses for years and years. I'm like, what? <laughs> How is that possible? So um, I... I, I've, I've treated horses with it. I've, I've, I've treated my dogs with it. Like it's, I, it just, and it's really funny. I've, I've got two big dogs. One comes to work with me sometimes and they love being in the field of 
microcurrent. Like I, I, I do know that animals are much more energetically sensitive than, than we are, right? And horses, it's just magical to watch them. You think of this big, massive animal, but they are, they're so sensitive, right? You just think about how they're, how they flinch when a little fly, you know, goes on them. So I've seen, I've seen animals um, respond extremely well. We don't have a ton of um, again, really good data, but once you, once you see it, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. it's yeah. pretty neat. Yeah. And that, that's the struggle that, that I've, that I've had is, um, you know, there's just not a lot of data out there because, you know, Mandy and I, we have two horses and we've used DC based current with yeah. um, our dogs, our, uh, our horses and with great, great results. And uh, the, the challenge that we have is it's a passion for us. And like, we would love to be able to, you know, work with a vet and be, you know, be able to help. But um, not having some of that research makes it a little difficult. But my ultimate question with that is when you're you know, dealing with like a DC base, like active current, you can see, you know, when the protective mechanism hits, the muscle is going to contract a little bit. And like the horse, for example, you know, we'll, we'll let you know. But when you're using something like uh, it is funny because when it's a good current, too, they just like they knock out. Like they're just immediately yeah. like maybe you'll have to be yeah. thinking you're holding like this, you know, <laughs> however much the horse weigh, holding him up while I'm working on him. But like when yeah. you're doing microcurrent, though, with like a horse or a dog, what are what things are you looking for? Because they can't really tell you. Anything. No. And I think I think that's why I loved working with horses and dogs is because there's no real placebo effect. Right. They're not telling you what they want to hear. Either their behavior changes or it doesn't. Um, so I, I haven't been around horses a ton, but I was working with this one who was super arthritic, old, this is beautiful animal. And she started like just pawing at the ground. I'm like, what, what's happening? What's she doing? And her head was dropping and her owner was like, well, she wants to lie down. I'm like, oh, well that, that to me is a good thing. Cause we were running, you know, cause regardless of what current or sorry, what frequencies you're running, some people just get what we call dwarfed, right? So whether you're running scarring or an emotional frequency or inflammation or whatever, some people just energetically are like, whoa, that feels good. I feel stoned. I feel sleepy. And I think animals are just more, more sensitive and we get that sedative sort of euphoric effect with them because we're, you know, and especially the population that I work with, um, and we touched on it a little bit with the emotional frequencies. They don't want to let their guard down. They don't want to let anything in. They're tough. They don't feel anything like, um, so I, I, and then they're, you know, they're, they're holding themselves to a different state. Whereas an animal, like nothing to prove, like if you feel good, lie down. If you want to fall asleep, fall asleep, you know? So, um, that's been, that's been cool because like I said, there's, there's, there's no placebo effect with, with animals. They're either going to be sedative and relaxed while the current's running. And then afterwards, like, how are they moving? Like, they're not going to hold, they're not going to change their gait or try to push through a barrier the way humans do. They're going to run. They're going to stretch. They're going to, like, they're going to move just more freely. You'll see that organically unfold before your eyes. Do you tend to see the same results, uh, like, as quickly as you do with, you know, people? Yeah, and I don't have like a ton of mileage working with animals, but I, I've had like really good good success, even if it's their owners telling me after saying that, you know, like, wow, this this lasted, you know, quite a few days. And that, that's always a trick, right, is how long is it going to last? And I never want to, I always say it's like a party trick. If you're coming into my clinic for an hour and your arm went from 40 degrees to 180, okay, well, that's great, but did it hold? Like, is it like that the next day and the day after that? Be other th if, if it's only working when you're with me in my room, that's not a success story. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, with, with animals, it's no different. We want to make sure that they're continuing to move and that everything is continuing to, to work and hold. Now, we're, uh, we're, we're going down the total, total like, it's supposed to be a show about athletes. Yeah. But you know what? Dogs and horses are athletes, too. <laughs> and ra um, race horses <laughs> are like, yeah, they're just big athletes. But, like... Um, you know, we know DC, like DC current can really only be used, at least from what we have been told and studied with, is with, uh, dogs and horses. It, sure. you, it, microcurrent, would it be the same? I mean, can you speak on that? Are there any other I have no like idea. Yeah. I can't, I'm I can't a, comment. I'm going to try the DC current on my idea. cat tonight. Okay. We'll see if it's... <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, yeah. Your, your yeah. cat, uh, your cat's not going to make it, Chris. <laughs> I think you know that. 
Cool. Well, this has been great, Kim. It's been awesome to connect with you and, and learn a little bit more about how you do things with athletes specifically and just kind of how there's a little bit of a difference between that and, you know, some of the stuff Dr. McMakin um, has, has done. But um, we're, we're huge supporters of you guys down here in Memphis and, and Birmingham for Chris as well. And, um, you, you know, we, we really are passionate about trying to bring this out to the open a little more. And that's kind of the goal of the podcast, too, is right. like, you know, we want to help spread this message. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's been great to have you. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so you gave out your website and all that. Is there is there anywhere else that anybody can connect with you? Um, Instagram, FSM Sports 365 is on there. Um, I You know, I try to put a multitude of different things um, regarding health and wellness on there. Microcurrent's part of it. Um, but, yeah, just the website, fsmsports365.com, and there's a contact button on there so people can reach out ask questions about seminars or um, just as an athlete right. um, for injury stuff and recovery. Great. Great. Well, we appreciate it. And, uh, guys, again, if you got any value out of this, if you liked it, even if it was the animal part, guys, go share the show, please. We, we appreciate that. So appreciate you guys for listening. Thanks again for joining. Kim, and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Great. Thanks.